You're listening to Fast Facts Ask the Expert with Katrina Sanders, brought to you in part by our friends at TheraBread. Stay tuned after the episode for a special message. Hello, and welcome back to Ask the Expert with your expert for this week, Katrina Sanders. And this week, I am bringing another expert onto the pod with me, my don't tell everybody, but she is my favorite expert, and that is the perio expert, the perio doc in heels, Dr. Mia Geisinger. Welcome to the pod, Dr. Mia. Hey, Katrina. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I am so excited. So for for everybody hanging out listening to this episode, we are here hanging out in Dr. Mia's presidential suite here at the panel upgrade at the panel upgrade at the a worthy at the aap supported rdh under one roof uh programmatic content that we're going to be presenting so we're just here having some wine and i just like enjoying ourselves i feel we're preparing our deck we're doing this amazing course at rdh under one roof supported and sponsored by the aap talking about perio and the dental hygienist role in managing perio and i thought you know let's just hit record because that's what everybody thinks when they're sipping wine and talking about gum disease together right on a nerd way of doing it let's do it (laughs) so um, i thought i would just hit record and i would ask dr mia one of the most common questions that i actually get quite a bit just to see what the periodontist's expertise thought is on that And that is the underlying concept that I'm asked consistently about patients who present with active probing depths. So I'm talking about a bleeding four, bleeding five, bleeding six millimeter probing depth in maybe localized, maybe generalized areas. And the hygienist is exploring this area and is not noting any detectable calculus. So now it's like, what do I do? I'm not noting detectable calculus, but there is some kind of a response happening. So, Dr. Mia, what what the heck is going on in these cases? Well, you know, much to the chagrin of everyone who's ever served as an examiner on a dental or dental hygiene board, and probably the folks at Old Dominion University who are making the ODU 1112, um, <laughs> I hate to break it to everybody, but we stink. At <laughs> detecting calculus. Yeah, sure do. So in probing depths that are four millimeters and greater, um, we have about a coin flip on whether or not we can accurately detect calculus when it is present. We tend to be just a little bit better on the mesial and the distal than we are on the buccal and the lingual. But we're not great if we look at can we detect calculus once we then go ahead and visualize that calculus in another way, whether that is open access with a flap or if we go ahead and extract the tooth and actually look at that calculus underneath the microscope. We also know that in probing depths that are greater than four millimeters or four millimeter probing depths and up that bleed, they have calculus in them pre-instrumentation almost 98% of the time. So if we haven't taken a curette down there, there is calculus in those deeper pockets. And then even after we instrument, and some of this is a little bit squishy because there are different factors that affect the residual calculus that we see, including the probing depth, the area of the tooth that the calculus is on, and also operator experience. Shockingly enough, first-year residents are not as good as faculty. Well, and that's crazy. <laughs> um, but even after instrumentation, there are islands of calculus that are left somewhere between about 27% and 73% of sites still have residual calculus on those root surfaces. And lastly, we know it's not really about the calculus. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the calculus is an issue because it retains live plaque on or a live dysbiotic biofilm on the surface of the calculus. If we could in some way sterilize that calculus and remove all the live plaque, you know, from not just the outer surface, but also, you know, Calculus is kind of a condo complex mm-hmm. or yeah. live bacteria that's in all the little nooks, <laughs> right? Um, if we could get that live plaque off of there, the calculus itself would be an irritant, but it wouldn't be 
an etiologic factor for disease. So even if we don't feel calculus, if we have those deeper pockets, thinking about instrumentation to remove calculus if it is there, but also to flip the switch on that dysbiotic biofilm to introduce an environment that then becomes aerobic versus anaerobic mm -hmm. to mechanically remove that biofilm is critically important. Do you find that in your practice that you have those sites where you know intellectually that there's calculus underneath the gum line, but man, you can't feel oh, it. Oh my gosh, of course. And the cool thing about working in a perio office is I can complain enough and then one of my doctors will come over and flap that or I can visualize it, <laughs> which is really amazing. But I will say it is incredible what you say. Uh, as a hygienist who works in a perio office doing surgeries where I'm flapping cases, where my colleagues have done non-surgical SRP on these cases and they come to me and I know they are extremely skilled clinicians. Yeah. Some of them are people who are students of mine. I taught them. And, you know, now they're out there working clinically. And when I evaluate what the quality of that root surface is upon a flap, it tells you a lot. It tells you the whole narrative about why that disease process remained. Those micro islands, those small, you know, calculus can be a million different things. It can be spicules. It can be veneers. It can be you know, small little micro islands. It can be, you know, you large that we goes onto that the rest out of it. it. And then exactly. you can't feel it at all. Exactly. Yeah. And so what's amazing is that the body becomes its own disclosing agent in a way, right? When you start to see that demonstration of that inflammatory response and how exaggerated that response is in relation to the amount of calculus that's there, that is what the AAP has helped us to define when it comes to the risk that the patient's systemic condition may in fact be influencing that localized observation of inflammation. So I, you are spot on. There, There's likely residual calculus, <laughs> even though we can't feel it with our 1112 ODU Explore. <laughs> and the idea there becomes, what is the end point of our treatment? Is it we scraped the root surface until it's glass smooth? Or is the end point of our treatment looking at the resolution of inflammation in our patients? Absolutely. You know, the example I always give to new students in dentistry and dental hygiene is if I take my arm like this and I smack it, it doesn't bleed. Right. Healthy tissue should not bleed when we strike it. So just because we're taking a probe in there, I don't care if they're on blood thinners. We may see it more readily if they're on blood thinners, but if we don't have inflammation, we should not see bleeding. From a positive predictive value standpoint, if we see bleeding, particularly consistent bleeding or bleeding at those deeper probing depths, we have to have a light bulb going off that says there's something else going on and we need to try something to resolve that inflammation. I love that. And, and, and that's, I think, really why the question comes up, right? Clinicians are asking, you know, hey, there, there's a probing depth here. There's a bleeding op observation. So inflammation is happening. I don't think there's still calculus in that area. And and so I, I'm so glad for the questions. I'm glad that colleagues are asking this to really open up the concept that our calculus detection skills have been challenged. And it's also important to note that cementum is in fact grainy. And so sometimes it's hard for us to delineate or identify which is which. And so I, I just I love those questions because I think that really drives home what truly is the goal of our treatment? What do we hope to see for our patients? And that I'm more than just a tooth scrape, <laughs> right? That I'm able to see the fact that my patient has an inflammatory response. And I know there's something more, something deeper going on in those areas. I mean, listen, gum gardener to tooth scraper. <laughs> I'm telling you, we are all in the business of oral wellness and overall wellness. And it really starts with recognizing that inflammation, making our hygiene diagnosis, and coming up with a treatment plan to address those areas of inflammation that is individualized and risk-based for that patient. That's right. Oh, I love it. Well, you heard it here first, folks, from my favorite perio expert, the amazing perio doc in heels, Dr. Mia Geisinger. Thank you so much for joining me for another fabulous episode of Ask the Expert. I will see you all next month for more expertise content. See you soon. Please feel free to reach me on Instagram at The Dental Wine Genist or on my website, www.katrinasanders.com. Cheers. 
Thank you for tuning in to Fast Facts, Ask the Expert with Katrina Sanders, and thank you to our partners on this episode, TheraBreath. Dry mouth is a common condition, but it's not always easy to get patients to treat it at home. Some patients may complain about mouth rinses that burn or feel slimy. If that is the case, try recommending the TheraBreath Dry Mouth Formula. It moisturizes and soothes dry mouth symptoms immediately and contains naturally sourced salivary enzymes that stimulate saliva production. The tingling mint flavor provides a pleasant tingling rinsing experience, and we all know patients are more likely to use something that they enjoy. If you want to try a free sample, visit oralcarepro.com slash therabreath. That's oralcarepro.com slash therabreath.